this research methods uh, video is about ethics, ethical content of uh, research. First, look at these five questions on the previous lesson on content analysis. There are the answers, you know what to do. So, ethics. You all know what ethics means and how to use ethical considerations in planning some research. Informed consent, confidentiality, anonymity, gatekeeper, control, honesty, covert, over power and authority, debrief, British Sociological Association, the BSA. Okay, so, put simply, ethics means thinking about with whether or not the research you are planned is morally right or wrong. You should not put, do the research that endangers yourself or endangers or in any way damages the people you are studying. And by damaging, I mean psychologically. So there's the famous Milgram experiment. It's the one in this photograph here. In the Milgram experiment, people who are being experimented on, they think they're giving people electric shock perhaps even lethal ones. They're not. No one's being electrocuted, no one's being hurt, but they think they're doing it. That's not ethical anymore. When the experiment's finished and you tell them it's all a fake, you've now you know, saying to them, and by the way, you're the sort of person who would electrocute somebody if somebody told you to. You're not allowed to do that to people anymore. So, to make sure your research is ethical, the people you are studying must give you their informed consent. You've got to explain exactly what you're doing. Most of the time, you're not allowed to do covert work. You've got to be open about it. And you've got to say to them, at any point in the research, if you don't want to do it anymore, you have the right to withdraw on a one body. That's informed consent. You're not just asking them, explaining things first. So, for example, an example that's going wrong. Paul Willis, here he is, in the book we're doing in education, Learn to Labour. Remember, he did some participant observation, working as a teacher, on a group of lads he called the, the lads. You know, the, you know, the lads and the year olds. Now, the, the problem is, he did ask the boys if you could do the research. Because he's older than them, and a teacher. Maybe they didn't feel they were able to say no even if they'd wanted to. Maybe they felt pressurised. So they're not really giving their informed consent, somebody might say. Right, once you're finished, it's got, you've got to debrief the participants. You've got to explain to them what you've found. You've got to clear it all with them. You've got to, you know, you've got to be really honest with people. I found this, I'm going to write this. You've got to say to them, I will make sure you can't be uh, identified, anonymous. If somebody asks me who you are, it'll be confidential, I won't tell them. You've got to go through this process. Get their consent and then debrief them afterwards. Now, why is all this important? Well, depending on what you're studying. So James Patrick did this famous book. He joined the Glasgow Street Gang. Yeah? He worked in an approved school like a, an old version of a crew, got to know some kids, joined the gang, hung about with them, wrote this book. To make sure the boys couldn't get in trouble, he changed their names, and he used made-up nicknames, he just made sure they couldn't be identified. He didn't use their actual nicknames, he made up nicknames for them. He also waited about a year before he published his research. It was a moral panic at the time, about knife crime, he didn't want to release it during the moral panic, he thought it might make it worse. So, by doing all this, you know, he didn't get anybody in trouble. However, he did have to think. His work was covert. So when he published the book, if somebody he was studying read the book, would they feel used by the fact that their, who was their mate was in fact not their mate, it was a social scientist studying them. 